Hi, I'm Kai Hughes, and I'm the Executive Director of the International Cotton Advisory Committee. To mark World Cotton Day, the ICAC has produced these series of videos to refute some of the many myths and misunderstandings about the cotton industry. The claim. Cotton is a very thirsty crop that requires enormous amounts of water to produce a kilogram of fibre. In our second Truth About Cotton video, we're going to address one of the most common and ridiculous myths about cotton. Of all the mistruths that people publish about cotton, this one grabs the most headlines. Years ago, the highly respected NGO, the WWF, or World Wildlife Fund, commissioned a study that concluded that cotton required a staggering 20,000 litres of water to produce just a single kilogram of fibre. That's more than 5,200 gallons. This number spread around the world like wildfire. Those who compete with cotton or who have an agenda to speak against it have kept this number alive for years and despite repeated efforts, the WWF refuses to adjust it, which is a shame. Because the amount of water that cotton really needs to produce a kilogram of fibre is only 1,214 litres, 94% less than the 20,000 litres. So how can there be such a huge discrepancy between those numbers? The answer is that the study included two different types of water. Firstly, it included green water. Green water comes from rainfall and it falls from the sky. It's either absorbed into the ground or it evaporates and it returns to the clouds. Counting this type of water against cotton production is nonsense because by this logic, parking lots also consume thousands of litres of water every time it rains. So do rooftops and athletic fields and even the oceans themselves. So clearly green water that falls from the sky shouldn't be counted. Then. There is blue water. Blue water comes from lakes or streams and this type of water is used to irrigate crops that don't get enough water from rainfall alone. So this is the only type of water that should be counted. It accounts for water that could be used for something else but instead has been diverted to grow cotton as well as any other type of crop. And there's another thing. As we mentioned in the first of these videos, The Truth About the Aral Sea, cotton is a xerophyte, which means it actually thrives in places that are too dry and inhospitable for most other crops. Its roots grow stronger and deeper as it seeks water, so where water's scarce, cotton is almost always the crop that gives the best economic return for this limited resource. To put things into perspective, here in the Northern Hemisphere, where the ICAC is headquartered, you actually need more water to grow an acre of grass than you need to grow an acre of cotton. And of course, neither lawns nor golf courses provide fiber or food. With less water, cotton produces both. So, visit www.icac.org and click on the Global Cotton Promotions button to see more truths about cotton. Thanks for watching. Okay, so that video was kind of interesting. Um, let me share my screen with you all. I think that's visible to everybody. Raise your hand if you can't see it. No, I'm joking. Okay, so Miguel said that cotton was the king of fibers for genes. Well, it, it of course was. Um, in the 50s and 60s, every gene was basically 100% cotton. And now I think we don't even have genes that very often that are made of 100% cotton. Um, anyway, cotton is still the, ma the majority fiber that's in a, in a gene. And the whole conversation about cotton is super complicated. It's not easy to explain. There's a lot of reasons why it's difficult to explain. Most um, synthetic or man-made fibers come out of a factory. So when they come out of a factory, you can control the inputs and you can control the outputs and you can control the production. Um, cotton comes from um, 26 million farmers throughout the world and sometimes a farm across the street from another farm might have a different result or a different condition. So it's really difficult to have um, exact information. And when you go through the internet, which is a lot of cotton lovers get agitated by this, if you go through the internet, 
just this one little slide shows you three different pieces of information. Cotton Made in Africa's website says that one kilogram of cotton, a global average is 2,100 liters, which has nothing to do with the movie. And it says that their cotton is only one liter. And then World Wildlife, as you saw in the movie, says 20,000. But if you go through the internet just a little bit and take some time, I do it sometimes just for fun or agitation, you find different numbers from everybody. This one is the World Count website, and it says it takes 10,000 liters to grow a kilogram. But it doesn't stop only with water, it's in everything. One would think that the environmentalists believe that organic cotton is better for whatever reason, but there's stories, this one was in quartz, how organic a cotton t-shirt might be worse for the environment than regular cotton. There's no information, there's no, there's no data, there's nothing to say there other than that, that title. And then this is one of my favorites, which says rice and wheat production use more water than all the other crops put together. Well, you can see in the picture that rice um, loves water. But I'm from Canada, and if you know anything about the prairies in Canada, there's very little water. So wheat is not like that at all. My point is, through all these slides, is they're everywhere. And they're in every subject about sustainability. But it's hard to believe them when there's no data. So let's go into the cotton. The cotton industry is a big industry that has a lot of impact on a lot of people. It's grown in 80 countries. And these are estimates, but there's something like 250 million people involved in cotton production, providing income for 110 million households. 500 million people around the world, or 6.6 .6 of the entire population of the world, make some portion of their income from cotton. It's a very, very important product. And unlike man-made fibers, which I said before, cotton is grown once a year. And so the once a year issue of the product coming out makes it difficult because the farmers, like the guy in this picture, when he produces his field, he wants his money as soon as possible. Whereas the synthetic fibers or man-made fibers, they come out daily. So payment for all the cotton in the world is a, is a complicated process. And usually there's a trader involved to help facilitate the payment. And of course, the most important thing is to store it. Um, storing cotton is not an easy thing, and, but it's done and it's handled. Um, most farmers don't have data about their inputs. Yet in the global communications, everyone seems to think they do, but they don't so far. I think in the future they will. And I think we're going to that because I'm a big proponent of transparency. And transparency is only going to exist when farmers can record all of the inputs and the outputs. So what is cotton? First of all, it's um, estimated to be a 7,000 year old plant. It's basically a tree. Um, the fiber itself is soft. It has good strength. It's absorbent. ICAC, which um, you guys saw the movie from, ICAC is an intergovernmental organization. It represents 44 countries that produce or consume cotton. It's been around since 1938. They say on their website, I looked it up last night, that cotton can absorb 27 times its weight in water which is incredible. Um, obviously it's comfortable in hot weather. Um, it has a bad reputation, which lots of us want to change. And it grows, as a movie said, in arid countries, not in wet countries. A friend of mine wanted to grow it in Vietnam and would love to grow it in Vietnam, but it's too much rain. So it needs to grow in a kind of dry environment. Quality of cotton is measured primarily from the first step is, of course, the length of the fiber. So different plants have different lengths, and we'll get into that in a little bit later. The length is important. The maturity, the strength, of course. Micronair, which is, um, boils down to the fineness of the fiber, the dirt in the, fi in the fiber, and the color. These are all features that give um, people um, an examination of the, of the quality so they can decide what price to pay based on the quality. Longer fiber is, of course, stronger than shorter fiber. This is what cotton looks like under a microscope. It's kind of like a ribbon, a flat ribbon, and very able to, as I said, absorb. So production. I think one of the most interesting parts of cotton is where it's produced and how it's produced and how we understand the details of its production. So we have here three different um, years of production. We have 2019, 2018, 2017. All these statistics are from ICAC. I continually use their numbers. And you'll see, and it doesn't really matter how, how big or, or not, but the three big players are China, India, and the United States. And you can see the quantities that they grow compared to the other countries, like Argentina at the bottom or Burkina Faso. 
the African countries produce obviously much, much less than these countries. This is maybe a little bit hard to see, but hopefully you guys can see it. I find this a super fascinating number. If you scroll to the very bottom, to the total number of farmers, this is, I guess, their assessment. You're talking about 26 million farmers in the world growing cotton. And each of those farmers makes a decision every year on what seed to grow, what pesticides or fertilizers they're gonna use and how they're gonna manage their crop. Um, they are business people um, and they make a judgment every year on what is best for their business. Um, what else can I say to you? You can see other things that I think are interesting here is the size of farms so that you get a feeling for that. And if you take a look, let's just, let's just pinpoint, um, let's look at China where the average farm size is 0.38 hectares. And then you look at Brazil, which is 757 or you look at the United States, which is 312, or Australia, which is 412. So you can see that the farmers themselves are completely different operations and businesses. Um, you can see also how many farmers are involved. In Australia, there's only 1,350 farmers involved. And in China, there's almost 8 million. In India, there's 9 million. I guess there are questions coming in that we'll get to afterwards. Um, let's skip this one. Well, everyone talks about organic and organic is obviously an important element. Consumers seem to love organic and there's a lot of talk about organic. But what's interesting about organic is when you go into the numbers, and these are a little bit old, but these are the numbers I have for today. If you look at the last five years from between 2012 to 2017, the percent of organic cotton was not 1%. It was in um, 2016, it was 44% of 1% which means a little bit less than half a percent. And it's hovered in that area for five years. Now it seems that the conversation about organic is much bigger than half a percent, half of 1%, but this is the numbers that it's grown. And here are the countries that it's grown in. It's grown primarily in India. You can see that India is the major producer. China is less than half of India. Turkey is a tiny production, the United States is tiny. And then we really get small after that. So there's not a lot produced, which raises the question. And um, I think everyone can ask themselves this question because it's kind of obvious. If there's 26 million farmers and organic is so great, why don't more farmers grow it? And I guess that's a business proposition that they have to decide. And I guess that boils down to at the end of the day, the price that consumers pay. So if consumers are not willing to pay for the price that the farmers want for organic, they won't grow it. And if they would pay, they would grow it. It seems like an obvious business question. So then we can move on to, just to put cotton in perspective, when I started my career, um, cotton had a very, very high percentage of global fiber consumption. So this is from Lensing, our friends in the man-made fiber world. Um, you can see here that synthetic fibers at the bottom left, the gray part of the pie, today account for 64.2%. Synthetic fibers mean fundamentally petroleum-based fibers that do not biodegrade. I can say that again twice if you want. They don't biodegrade and they account for 64.2% of the industry. And yet they continually grow in market share even though we all talk about sustainability. Um, Wood-based wood cellulose fibers account for 6.2 and cotton continually drops in its market share, oddly, because it's a, it's a natural fiber, it biodegrades. Wool is a tiny, tiny market share and it's a wonderful fiber. And other natural fibers are 4.4. So you can see that there's a lot of work to be done in sustainability in flipping the use of synthetic fibers to natural fibers, whether it's cotton or whether it's wool or whatever fiber. Cotton has a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of what we call identity programs. So for a fiber that has really one major feature, um, you have all these different brands that are trying to sell you on, or industry on why their cotton is better. But it is just cotton. So there's fair trade cotton, there's US Trust Protocol, which is now popular, there's BCI cotton, there's Supima. There's all these different brands and one's hard pressed to actually understand what is the fundamental difference in the product, not in the way it's grown or how the workers are treated, but in the actual product itself. So let's talk about GMO cotton. There's a lot of talk about GMO through the industry and through all sorts of our society. 
Um, GMO was introduced in 1996 in the cotton world. Today, it accounts for 80% of the world cotton hectares, well, as of 2017. In Argentina and Australia, it is 100% of the crop. In Ch you saw the, the, the charts of who grows the most cotton. In China, Pakistan, USA, and India, the three, four biggest, it accounts for 96 to 93% of all the cotton grown. The reason, the reason that it's grown and the reason it's used is it improves fiber quality and yield by controlling the insect damage. There's another kind of cotton that we should know about, which is called extra long staple. This is a measurement of the fiber length of the cotton plant. If it's longer than 1.38 of an inch or 34.9 millimeters, it's considered as extra long staple. It's grown in a, not every country, but it's grown in the United States, Egypt, Peru, China, and it's got marketing names. And the marketing names that you might or might not know, but if you're in your, in your future in your career, I'm sure you will know, is Supima, Suvan, Sea Island, and Pima from Peru. BCI is a cotton um, identity program which aims to transform the cotton production worldwide into a sustainable mainstream commodity. But what does that mean? What it means um, is that um, brands have, have supported, and you can see at the bottom in the green, the, um, just some members of BCI, they have a very wide range of brands that support the initiative. The idea of BCI cotton from the beginning was to educate farmers to grow their cotton more sustainably. And I think it's a fabulous idea. Um, their mission is to make global production uh, available and better for the people who produce it, better for the environment, grows in, and better for the sector's future. Um, BCI is not for profit. It is the largest sustainable program in the world. Um, it's trained two to three million farmers and accounted for 22% cotton production in 2018 and 19. There's a problem with it. The only problem that has with BCI is that BCI works on, this is a complicated concept, but it works on a mass balance system. So if a mill gets an order for let's say 100,000 yards of BCI cotton for the order to be fulfilled, they do not have to use BCI to fill the order. What they do is they just place a new order for 100,000 yards of BCI and they can use it in any order they want in the future. The point is not that it's in the order, the point is that it's actually purchased. So that's good from the purchasing side, but it's terrible from the transparency side because every garment that you get, you don't know what's in it and you don't know where it's from. So that's their downfall. I'm, I'm sure they're trying to figure out a solution for it. And then hopefully they have to have a solution because at the end of the day, we as consumers will want to know where all our products are from, what's inside them, and what is the environmental impact of them. Organic cotton. So organic cotton doesn't use, as you can imagine, any, hold on, just, does not use any genetic, genetic modification seeds. It can only use organic fertilizer and pesticides. It cannot use synthetic herbicides and defoliants utilized as beneficial insects. And you cannot make a farm organic just because you decide to turn your farm organic. If you have a farm and you want to become an organic farm, then the first two to three years that you produce your farm, you're in what's called transition. So, so let me go to transparency. Um, I think from my point of view, that every consumer product that is in our lives, everything that is in the room around where you're sitting, we should know where it's from, we should know what it's composed of, and we should know the environmental and social impact of how it was produced. We know none of that with any consumer products that we have, whether it's our iPhones, whether it's our glasses, whether it's our furniture, we know nothing about every single product around us. And this is gonna change in the next 10 years. You, the students, are the ones that are gonna change that the most and you can impact it. So when it comes to cotton, it's a really simple request that we have as an industry to go forwards in the future. And the request is, we know what the farm, who's the farm? We wanna know what the farmer used to grow his cotton. What were the inputs? What were the outputs? And what was the environmental impact of the field? If we do not have that information, we have no idea what we're doing. In case you like cotton and you want to read books, here's some suggestions for you. And you can write me or ask me any questions at this um, email address. Thanks.